Well, we were considering how we might use a collection of sound recordings we had called the OP Collection of Children's Games and Songs. I'd been involved with a number of projects putting some sound recordings online of, of accents and dialects recordings um, that were very well received by the public. And we knew this collection had a great deal of popular appeal, but also academic appeal. And we were approached by the Institute of Education because they were considering doing a modern survey, a contemporary survey. Uh, and so it kind of like a perfect fit really. That was sort of the starting point because it's the most famous collection so we wanted to make that available but it's, it's presented on a Playtimes website here at the British Library alongside some field recordings made in contemporary schools, so a school in Sheffield, uh, a school in London, demonstrating the same, similar and indeed different games that were played in, in the Opie's times but also some wonderful archival film footage from the BFI some fantastic still photography from the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. We've also hooked up with the Bodleian Library where the Opie's manuscript archive was deposited. Peter and I own Opie were a husband and wife team. Iona's still alive. They were very interested in children's folklore, for want of a better word, really, uh, and children's culture. So they're, they're you know, widely acknowledged as, as internationally renowned researchers on children's literature, for instance, children's nursery rhymes, children's culture. And they were particularly interested also in, in sort of children's folklore and, and traditional customs. So people were aware of their research. Uh, and it's very much presented both to an academic and a, a general audience. Um, but I think as soon as you hear the actual sound recordings that relate to the printed word, it brings it more to life, really. Um, let's, have, let's have farmers in his den, shall we? <laughs> OK. One, two, three. The farmers in his den. The farmers in his den. E-I-S-E-O, the farmers in his den. The farmer wants a wife. The there are a lot of tropes around the relationship between children's play cultures and children's media cultures. A lot of negative um, kind of common sense assumptions that media cultures ha have a detrimental effect on children's play cultures. So children, for example, are said to be um, less imaginative because they're watching television, they're playing computer games. The children don't know how to socialize anymore because they're sitting in front of media, they're sitting in front of screens. The whole screen culture is seen to be detrimental to children's play. So the project is really about um, investigating some of those questions and having answers to some of those questions. <laughs> We wanted contrasting schools. We didn't, unlike the Opie's um, UK-wide survey, we had two years to do quite a close analysis of two uh, playgrounds. Um, so we wanted um, a diversity, some diversity in, in terms of um, you know, ethnic groups, socioeconomic groups, um, but weren't aiming to get a kind of representative sample of um, UK playground cultures. So Sheffield University, um, the, the people we were working with has a, a working relationship with the school. So they decided to work with that school, which is in a primarily white working class area. Um, so in contrast, we um, found a school in London with a very multi-ethnic population. So j just trying to get a range of cultures, socioeconomic groups. I remember playing lots and lots of games, both in the playground at school, but also we lived in a, in a small close, so playing out in the street with neighbours and friends and what have you. And the game I particularly remember is a game which we called Aki 123, which is documented by the Opies. It's captured on a number of sound recordings by the Opies. And my personal area of interest, um, my responsibilities here at the library are sociolinguistics, so dialect material. And what's fascinating is the number of terms used across the country for exactly the same game. So what I called Aki 123, which is a basic chase game where you return to a home base and touch either a tree or a lamppost or whatever and, and declare yourself free or saved or whatever, has you know huge numbers of names across the country, Block 123. And I've got young children at the moment, we live in Buckinghamshire, and they call it 4040, and it's exactly the same game. They call it 4040, they have a slightly different set of um, terms that they use within the game. And, and so, yes, exactly the same game played across time and across geographic space? Um, well, it was quite a kind of immersion into trying to make sense of chaos, basically, um, as an as a outside observer. 
um, that kids come onto the playground screaming. There's this kind of, and Iona Opie talks about this as well in, in the people on the playground, that kids just, there's this release of energy that happens when they come out screaming. And especially when there's um, recording equipment available, that's one of the things they like to do is come up and, you know, we, we have lots of videos of the insides of mouths and, and eyes, you know, the extreme close-ups of eyeballs and things. Clapping games have really taken off um, in the past, I don't, I don't know how many years, but um, we're documenting lots and lots of clapping games, as many as the Opies in their um, nationwide survey we've documented on the two playgrounds. almost impossible to say that children's playground games are being influenced by media text because, for example, the, should I use the Call of Duty example? Um, Call of Duty, which is a, a, a video game and a, a first-person shooter video game, um, children often cited um, that they played Call of Duty on the playground. But when we um, investigated further, they were using that, that term, Call of Duty, to refer to a more general type of game, which was a, a type of, of war game, an army game, which has a long tradition. Anything is fair game to them. Media is not a kind of separate a separate resource that has some sort of glowing, you know, <laughs> powerful draw for them. It's just one of many, many resources that they're drawing on, including sedimented or, or traditional practices. <laughs> What's great about the collection is it, it ha has academic interest and cultural interest and heritage interest, but it's also got huge popular appeal. We all remember playing these games. Many of us assume they've disappeared and are quite surprised to discover that actually, you know, here we are in the 21st century and a game that we used to play is still being played. The rules may have been tweaked slightly or whatever. So I think it's that nostalgic fascination we all have with, with an abiding area of interest, really. I think for the British Library, it's another way of being able to demonstrate that we have wonderful collections across a variety of formats, print, sound, um, moving image, and that we're able to make them available not just to academics but to the public. So being able to put this material online has opened it up to all sorts of people. And the fact that it's a, it's a beyond text strand is, I think, what's made it uh, possible for us because it's another example of, of the British Library being able to show that we are beyond text. Many people think of us of the library of print, of newspapers, of published written word, but actually we've got a fantastic set of sound recordings. So to be able to add to that uh, through this Beyond Text project and to present our sound recordings online through that has been fantastic.